Welcome everyone, it's Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. Today, boy, what a great title. Meet the man who can prevent the next pandemic. Lessons learned from COVID-19. It features Dr. Dan Baruch of Harvard Medical School professor and head of Beth Israel's Deaconess Center for Virology and Vaccine Research. Dr. Baruch received his PhD in immunology from Oxford University and his MD from Harvard Medical School. He is currently the William Bosworth Castle Professor of Medicine and Professor of Immunology at Harvard Medical School, Director of the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research, as mentioned, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, a member of the Ragone Institute of M. GH, MIT, and Harvard, and part of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation collaboration for AIDS vaccine discovery. His recent work has contributed to the development of the single shot Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, which is now being rolled out in the United States and throughout the world. He was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2020. Dr. Baruch, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Really excited. I have a fair number of questions. In a second, we're going to get right to it. Uh, to give a little bit of further context relative to your background and having you on, I'm going to continue on a little bit longer. When the genetic sequence of COVID-19 virus was made public, and that was January of 2020, Dr. Baruch and his team were on the case. Over the next several months, they used scaffolding built over decades of vaccine experience in HIV, Zika, and other global infectious diseases to quickly develop a successful single-shot vaccine, now widely distributed by Johnson & Johnson. Now, Dan, I gave a, a pretty, at least by our standards, comprehensive background of the context and your background, but telling your story a little bit, uh, in terms of what led you to do what you do, which is unique within the field of medicine and your stature and your have arisen so greatly recently. I'd love to hear more about a little bit of that backstory. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so, well, first, uh, I certainly will do my best to help prevent the next pandemic, but I can't absolutely guarantee it. But I can tell you that, that uh, if another pandemic comes and if our skills and experience might be useful scientifically, and we'll certainly do our best to work on it. Um, my own background is both as a scientist and a physician. So when I graduated from college, then I trained in uh, I, I trained and did a PhD in immunology, learning about the intricacies of the human immune system and how it can fight disease. And then I wanted to be a doctor or a physician, so I went to medical school. And then I trained in internal medicine and infectious disease. And I was really motivated by the potential of using science to, um, to, to help uh, with global medical problems. And with my background and training, it naturally led to the field of infectious diseases because that is um, a, a, a field of uh, global need and uh, uh, global pandemics. And um, and, and then uh, I started my lab about 17 or 18 years ago, and uh, we started really learning about the immunology and virology of various diseases. Uh, and we've studied over the years a number of different diseases, HIV, Zika virus, uh, influenza, uh, and now COVID-19. And in each case, then we've tried to understand the inner workings, how the viruses work, how do they make you sick, and how the body responds to it. And is there anything in that process that we can exploit uh, to actually help patients and help patients either with therapeutics or with preventative strategies? Historically, vaccines are the single most important and impactful medical intervention that have probably saved more lives than any other medical intervention and the interventions that are critically needed in the context of uh, pandemics. In some cases, vaccines have been relatively straightforward to make, such as for COVID-19. In other cases, vaccines have been incredibly difficult to make, such as for HIV, which currently still remains a 40-year unsolved 
uh, medical um, uh, challenge for the world. And uh, I think that uh, part of it is contributing to basic research and part of it is actually helping to develop interventions that actually are meaningful to patients. So I came to the COVID question in January of 2020, not out of the blue, but after uh, about 16 or 17 years studying uh, other viruses and development of vaccine technologies that were promising for other viruses, such as HIV and Zika. And so we had novel and potentially important vaccine platform technologies in place. So when the COVID-19 pandemic started, which for us was really in January of 2020, then we were essentially all set and poised to go uh, with the idea that this vaccine platform technology that we had developed for HIV and Zika might actually be useful and potentially could contribute to the worldwide effort to control this disease. I'm happy to expand in, in sort of any of those directions, uh, but I could easily go on for the full hour, but I'll, uh, why don't I stop <laughs> there temporarily and uh, uh, see where the interests are of the group. Sure. Well, we have a, a fair number of questions, but I wouldn't say an overwhelming. So unlike many of I, our interviews, we could actually do a little bit of a, a deeper dive relatively to the intimate number of questions that we have. So from an, an outsider looking in, like you said, the genetic sequence in January of 2020, so ballpark about a year and a half ago, the vaccines were rolled out effectively, what, about eight or nine months ago. The world and people like yourself kind of came together and did things at breath, breathtaking speed. I mean, really amazing when you look back on it. Uh, you said that comparative to HIV, which has been much more complex, this was relatively, and I'm using that word in parentheses, easy. Uh, not that we have many scientists on board, although maybe we do, but tell us a reason why that's the case, and I guess how fortunate we were that it was. Well, um, for a virus like HIV, uh, there are challenges associated with the virus that have never been tackled before in the history of science, in the history of vaccine development. A part of it is that the virus is so diverse that uh, there isn't a single sequence that's even definable as HIV. It also can integrate very quickly into the host chromosome. Those type of features are not seen with other viruses like Zika virus or COVID-19, for example. So the intrinsic science of the virus is largely going to dictate how quickly vaccines can be developed. Now, the other feature is the advancement of vaccine technologies that um, uh, over the last 20 years, there have been the development of so-called gene-based vaccines, whereas traditionally vaccines are made by taking the virus and either attenuating it or growing it up and killing it, and that's the vaccine. Then over the last two decades, there's been the development of uh, so-called gene-based vaccines, which involves not the whole virus, but just the sequence of the most important part of the virus. And uh, in terms of gene-based vaccines, the two technologies that really have risen to the forefront are mRNA vaccines and vector-based vaccines. And those represent the vaccines uh, that are most widely used, at least in the Western world, uh, including the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for mRNA, and then the J&J &J and AstraZeneca vaccines for, uh, for, for vectors, as well as others throughout the world. Uh, the vaccines from China still are based on the traditional technology of whole killed viruses. Uh, so what we're seeing for COVID-19 is really the, the use of both traditional and novel vaccine technologies uh, that have come together to uh, essentially develop vaccines in an unprecedented uh, period of time for an unprecedented global need. And the performance of the vaccines as a whole has been nothing but astonishing. Uh, in terms of the, the, the efficacy of the vaccines, particularly in preventing severe disease. Now, no vaccines are perfect. All of, all, no medical interventions are perfect. And so there, there is always going to be a very rare uh, level of uh, adverse effects and side effects, as well as uh, there's going to be uh, breakthrough infections. And, and, and when we see those, we shouldn't be surprised because those are expected. Uh, there, there should 
not be an expectation of any medical intervention being absolutely perfect. But it is clear that all of these vaccines are truly life-saving interventions. And although we are faced with many threats currently of the Delta variant and now the Mu variant and other variants, um, as well as the logistic challenges of getting the vaccines out into the arms of people, not just in our country, but throughout the world. And we really do need to vaccinate the entire world uh, to stop the pandemic. Um, uh, that that uh, these vaccines have already had a tremendous impact on saving lives, uh, both in the US and abroad. So, so I think that uh, when I said that it was relatively straightforward, then I didn't mean it was easy in any respect. In fact, uh, uh, everything put together from the science to the clinical trials to delivery has probably been the most intensive and most complex um, work that our group has ever done and we've had the privilege of contributing to. Uh, but what I, what I meant when I said it's uh, less complex, I meant intrinsically the, vi the science of the virus allows for vaccines to be developed using currently available technologies. Whereas for some other, in some other uh, pathogens like, uh, like HIV, they have really resisted vaccine development for decades, uh, even with the same technologies. So, so uh, yes. uh, that, that, that's what I meant to say when I said uh, uh, relatively straightforward. I mean, a couple of questions, I guess, from there. There is obviously a difference between vaccines for prevention and treatment using HIV as an example, especially since the early mid 90s, there have been relatively effective treatments. May I argue that, and this could apply absolutely to COVID, the better that treatments get, is there, is, does the foot go off the gas pedal a little bit on the vaccine development? And kind of a part two of that question, what happened with COVID in the last 18 months, COVID-19, has that accelerated uh, knowledge, the community coming together, meaning the scientific community, uh, maybe by five to 10 years, which we'll probably get into when we discuss future pandemics, what we learned in this one and lessons moving forward. Uh, probably a pretty lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there, when historians look back and they write about the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 and 2021, there's going to be a lot of terrible things that are remembered. Um, but there are going to be some things that are going to be seen as incredible uh, advances, people coming together, the, the compassion of doctors, uh, uh, patients coming together, and as well as the power of science and uh, how the scientific community came together to address a question, uh, a problem that of, of a scope and intensity that none of us had ever dealt with before. Uh, from the very beginning, there was more open sharing of information than I have ever seen before in my experience, in my two decades experience as a biomedical researcher. Just one example, the Chinese researchers on January 10th, they just released the sequence of the virus on a publicly available website, available for anyone in the world to download and use at no charge with no restrictions. That allowed over 200 vaccine research groups around the world to immediately start making vaccines. Without that, uh, if they wanted to wait for peer reviewed publications or maybe not release it at all, it would have been a much longer process and the, the vaccines would have been delayed substantially. So that's just one of probably countless examples of how scientists from all over the world have collaborated and shared information often within a day of generating the data in their own laboratories. Wow. Uh, another example is I've been part of a, a WHO uh, call on uh, developing uh, preclinical models for COVID-19. That's met essentially every week, every Thursday morning, uh, from essentially early February up until the present day, where, where scientists from all over the world are showing their, their advances uh, in the development of models and the development of assays and the development of important information that, that uh, people uh, uh, use for their own work. That type of co collaboration and interactions I have never seen before. Also, uh, doctors and scientists from around the world are making their work available to the community uh, free of charge in preprint format almost 
immediately when the results are generated as opposed to what often takes a many months process of peer review and actual publication. So people are much more open to sharing information because fundamentally uh, we're all in this together and we all need to uh, share information, collaborate to, for, for everyone's work to move forward as quickly as possible. And I firmly believe that uh, one of the reasons why uh, there, there, were, there was the development of not one, but multiple vaccines in approximately a year is because of the open sharing of information between academia, industry, government, and other groups. Without that, then, then science would not have been able to progress at this pace. So I do think that the COVID-19 pandemic has really set new standards for how research is done and how doctors and scientists can address a pandemic from a very fundamental level, how clinicians can share information about uh, how to take care of patients. You know, the early experience in China was transmitted to doctors in the United States. Without that, then there would have been a lot more um, 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 uh, clinical care would not have advanced as quickly. Scientific research would not have advanced as quickly. Uh, the government responses would have been, uh, uh, I, I would say, even, even, even less organized than they were. Um, uh, but, but without open sharing of information on all fronts, the logistic front, the clinical front, and the scientific front, then the response to the pandemic would have been much worse than it, than it has been. So I look at a couple of different things. I look at the common cold where there's not a vaccine and there's not really theoretically a, a treatment other than some small things that plays itself out. But for the most part, 99.999% of the time, it doesn't kill us. So maybe there's not resources going into it because the devastation is relatively limited. The flu takes that up a level. There is a vaccine. But my bigger picture point that I'm getting to, uh, we've been on that for decade after decade after decade, uh, and it's still here with us. Will COVID-19 and its variants likely be something we'll need to live with for our lifetime? It's a really good question. If you asked me that question uh, back in November, December of 2020, then I was quite bullish. I thought that there were minimal variants, vaccines looked like they were 90 plus percent effective. And as long as we could vaccinate everyone in our country and the world fast enough, then we could probably stop the pandemic for good. Now, since then, um, uh, then we've seen the emergence of uh, multiple variants of sort of escalating levels of concern. Uh, right now, we're seeing the, the so-called Delta variant that I'm sure people have heard of, which is uh, much, more in, much more infectious and contagious. It's slightly resistant to antibodies from vaccines, but that's not its major feature. The major feature is that it's just a uh, hyper infectious. And so it can bypass a lot of the first, um, uh, sort of the first wall of antibodies induced by the vaccines and still infect uh, 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 unvaccinated people primarily, but also to some extent vaccinated individuals. Uh, now, the good thing is that the vaccines still prevent severe disease and likely prevent a substantial amount of mild disease. It's not completely quantified yet, uh, but the vaccines are still life-saving interventions, but they're, 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 they're definitely not perfect. And um, uh, we are battling essentially recurrent surges of different variants. First was the so-called alpha variant. Uh, then there was a lot of concern for the so-called beta variant that originated in South Africa. Now is, is primarily the uh, Delta variant, and we're hearing low-level rumblings about some other variants that might be coming. What is clear is that these variants emerge in areas of the world that have surges of infection, primarily in unvaccinated populations. So as long as there's areas of the world that are not fully vaccinated, then we're at risk for the development of uh, uh, additional variants, and we, we should have the expectation that each one is going to be more problematic than the previous one. So that really increases the urgency of vaccinating not just people in the United States, but throughout the world, because as long as there's a virus surging anywhere, 
there will be worse variants that emerge that will come back to our country and uh, essentially uh, take over the virus and cause uh, a surge like, we're, like we, well, we saw very clearly with the Delta variant, which as you know, originated with the massive surge that we saw in India a number of months ago. And that will likely continue to be a cycle that plays out as long as there are regions of the world that remain unvaccinated. Well, then that does create a level of complexity. There's what, 9 billion people in the world, even if the number we may need to get to is 80% being vaccinated, and then you add on boosters, and we'll get to some of that relatively shortly. I don't know how realistic that is in any sort of a short to intermediate time frame. That sounds like it's years, assuming it happens at all. And then there still is going to be variants that are going to be worse. Uh, that's a bit of an ugly picture. Make me feel a little better. <laughs> so I think the conclusion is saying that that if you asked me back in December of 2020, then I thought that it was it was a it was a realistic shot that we would just eliminate the pandemic within the year. Uh, now, I don't think that's reasonable anymore. I still think that uh, we might be able to eliminate the pandemic, but it will take longer. And there's also the possibility that COVID-19 will be with us um, uh, for the long term. I mean, we, we have at least four coronaviruses that are common cold coronaviruses that, that, are, that just are, are one of the causes of the common cold. And essentially every single person uh, has uh, antibodies to those. So they don't, they don't really cause serious disease. So is it possible that COVID-19 will get eliminated by vaccines? Uh, possibly. I still think that's a, that's a realistic possibility. Another possibility is that uh, it will continue as a human pathogen that will essentially co-circulate with us for the foreseeable future and might become the fifth coronavirus that is just part of the human ecosystem. Hopefully, hopefully with once it establishes itself and, and essentially everybody has immunity through a combination of vaccination and infection, then it may not be as pathogenic and it may not cause the same sort of death and destruction that we've seen over the last 18 months. That was going to be my next question. Uh, so you kind of beat me to the punch on that. And I guess it's also safe to assume, now I know you're going to be more focused on uh, an incredibly high percentage of the global population, the vaccine and boosters, but I'm making the assumption, similar to AIDS, uh, that treatments are going to get better and better, maybe significantly better. Uh, so again, I'm trying to find a little bit of a ray of optimism, and I'm probably making the assumption that COVID is going to be with us for a long, long time. But will it kind of feel the way that uh, the cold and flu is now, assuming we get the right treatments in place. So the percentage of people, unfortunately, with severe illness going into the hospital and dying goes way, way down. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, vaccine development is only part of the overall global right. response. Uh, it's probably the most important part because it's the intervention that is truly life-saving on a, on a population basis. There need to be treatments developed as well for those who do get sick. Uh, uh, either, either who are unvaccinated or have breakthrough infections. Um, treatments, in, interestingly, while vaccine development has gone uh, very, very well for COVID-19, better than ever before, treatments have been developed at a relatively slow pace. So still, there isn't any highly effective approved small molecule antiviral for COVID-19. Monoclonal antibodies uh, from several different companies are very effective, but are uh, uh, not used as widely as they, they should be or could be. Uh, and then some early candidate small molecule drugs like remdesivir are effective, but have you know, limited efficacy. So a truly highly effective antiviral is actually doesn't exist yet. And so that's another area of research that needs to be pursued and is being pursued, but, but uh, it's not, you know, it's a year and a half into it. And uh, th those, those, those optimal therapeutic drugs uh, don't yet exist. And I know the audience must be eventually waiting for, the, as it's part of our title, you know, preventing the next pandemic. And we've been hinting at that. We're going to get a little bit more aggressively into that in about 10 more minutes. But I think there are uh, general questions leading into that more about COVID. And why don't I start a series of questions, what I'm going to call kind of 
the risk benefit valuation, not to look at everything from an investing perspective and lens, although that's a little bit of my background. Uh, how do we balance, I guess you could say, vaccine efficacy and the vaccine safety by conducting risk and benefit assessments is maybe how someone from an investing background would somewhat look at it. So maybe the first question among several along that vein, what are the identified safety signals and risk factors? Well, um, so, so first I'll just emphasize that vaccine safety and public trust is the absolute most important part of any vaccine because unlike say a cancer chemotherapeutic drug, then you're giving vaccines to, to healthy people and a lot of healthy people. And so they have to be exceedingly safe. Uh, that being said, then, then no medical intervention is 100% safe. And so therefore, we're always balancing benefits and risk. And it's not just investors. Uh, doctors do it on li literally every single patient they take care of. They have to determine whether prescribing a certain drug for for you is uh, are the benefits outweighing the risks. So, so, so doctors instinctively do it every single time they take care of a patient. Uh, but more importantly, for the present question, then uh, the public health authorities and um, uh, the public health experts are obligated to do that uh, before they uh, recommend a widespread use of uh, any intervention, including vaccines. So, I mean, the, the, the current vaccines are exceedingly safe. Are remarkably safe, actually, uh, but but e each of the vaccines do have uh, common side effects and then sort of rare serious side effects. And what's what's most important is to be uh, absolutely candid upfront uh, with, uh, with 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 the general public as well as with the scientific and medical community as to what these risks are to ensure that we're always doing the best thing for our patients and the public. So. The common side effects with all the vaccines are a sore arm, uh, having flu-like symptoms for a day or two, uh, and sort of malaise, fatigue, maybe fevers. Um, um, and then there are very rare side effects that have gotten a lot of uh, attention in the media. I should emphasize they're, they're exceedingly rare, but they are likely linked to the vaccines. For example, the mRNA vaccines are linked with a particular form of uh, allergy called anaphylaxis, as well as inflammation of the heart called myocarditis. Um, the, uh, the, the, the adeno vector vaccines are linked with a very rare but potentially severe form of uh, thrombosis, as well as, um, uh, as well as a condition of the nervous system called Guillain-Barré syndrome. Uh, those are, occur in a couple cases out of a million, and uh, in most cases are, in, in almost all cases, are treatable. And uh, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, Jason's doing a great job of that. I'm going to get to them effectively right now. We do have a live audience for those that are saying, well, what is Angelo talking about? One of the questions that I was going to ask next, which relates to one or two of his, how do we know the vaccine works with the number of new cases occurring in vaccinated individuals? If you don't mind me a part two, specifically from one of our live participants, Jason, can you please help us common folk understand how the vaccine helps to stop variants when we still get the virus when we're vaccinated? It seems like we're still getting breakthrough cases even before the variants are arising. Yeah, so thanks. Very important questions. So, so there's several different ways of measuring vaccine efficacy. So the traditional way is a randomized clinical trial uh, where uh, doctors randomize. This is before any vaccines exist. So before, before there are any vaccines, then you're allowed to do so-called a placebo-controlled trial, which is the gold standard of evidence, where you take a group of a large group of people, 40 or 60,000 people, give half of them a vaccine, half of them a placebo. Nobody knows who got what. And then a few months later, then you see if uh, there were uh, a lot fewer infections in the vaccine group. That's, that's the highest level of evidence because, because uh, people are randomized and you don't know what you got. 
Now, after vaccines become available, then it's no longer ethical to do a study like that because you can't deny a large group of people a life-saving vaccine. That would not be considered ethical to do. So what, what people do is uh, a so-called real-world efficacy study, which is that you follow people who got the, who got the vaccine and you follow matched people who, who, who chose not to get the vaccine or potentially got the vaccine at a different point in time, and you look at um, uh, uh, differing rates. For example, the J&J &J vaccine was studied in a real-world efficacy study in South Africa against the Delta variant, uh, whereas essentially virtually all the current viruses circulating in South Africa are the Delta variant. And as part of the initial rollout of any vaccine to healthcare workers, which started, which was in February through May, then half a million healthcare workers got the vaccine, but um, um, a large number of healthcare workers did not get the vaccine because there was insufficient supply at that point in time. And then so, so uh, doctors basically followed the people who did get the vaccine and the people who didn't get the vaccine, even though it wasn't a randomized clinical trial. Um, and they found that there was a 92 to 96% protection against dying, against death, um, uh, which is essentially real world evidence that the vaccine has a profound effect against the most severe outcomes. Now, uh, against the older versions of the virus, there was also very substantial efficacy against infection and mild disease. And we still believe that there is still substantial efficacy against infection and mild disease for all the vaccines hovering maybe in the 50, 60, 70% range. Uh, it's hard to quantify with the Delta variant because it is so new and it's much easier to quantify the more severe outcomes. So that's why there is, there, is, there is some ambiguity as to the exact efficacy. We know the efficacy against the original strains. Unfortunately, the original strains don't really exist anymore, so it's not terribly relevant. Um, but we do feel that there is still substantial efficacy against mild disease. So, so while vaccinated people still can get uh, infected with breakthrough virus, then uh, the infection, the breakthrough infections are much less common than in unvaccinated individuals. So there is a substantial overall efficacy, but probably most importantly for vaccinated individuals who do experience breakthrough infections, there is a very strong protection against the severe disease outcomes of hospitalization uh, and death. Um, and then the second question was, I think, um, well, how, do, how does vaccination stop the emergence of variants if vaccinated people can still get infected? Right. And, and, and so, well, first, we, we do think that variants arise, um, I think of it more on a population basis, that in a population with a surging epidemic, such as in India, uh, there can be the emergence of new variants. One of them was called the Kappa variant. We haven't heard too much about that. One of them was called the Delta variant. We've heard a lot about that. And a variant that emerges anywhere in the world can essentially take over the global population, such as what happened in Europe and the United States and in many other regions of the world with the Delta variant. So uh, while no vaccines are perfect, then uh, vaccines uh, will substantially diminish the overall uh, surge of an infection. We've seen that even in our own country, how uh, states that had very low vaccination rates have really had a terrible experience with the Delta variant. I just heard on NPR radio on my way into work today that uh, hospitals in Idaho are formally starting to ration care um, uh, and, and, and not provide care to, to groups of people that ordinarily they would. Uh, and we're hearing about hospitals in the, the South and Midwest uh, being overwhelmed uh, with ICUs full of COVID patients at levels that are worse now than ever before in the pandemic, even the winter surge. Uh, whereas in states that have high vaccination rates, we're not seeing that. We are seeing an uptick in cases for sure, but we're not seeing the same sort of overwhelming of the whole healthcare system that we're seeing in states with low vaccination rates. So it's very clear that on a population basis, then vaccines uh, substantially diminish a surging pandemic. And with that, then uh, the expectation is that they would reduce the risk of emergence of a new variant. Will it eliminate it completely? No, it won't eliminate to zero, but it will vastly diminish the chances.
How do we assess the risk of severity, morbidity, mortality resulting from adverse vaccine reactions? I do think you kind of addressed that question a little bit earlier, but someone was insistent that I ask it more directly, and I thought it was a good one. Well, I mean, whenever there is defined adverse events to a vaccine, uh, then first there needs to be complete transparency and honesty about exactly what we know and what we don't know. And uh, in this case, because these vaccines have been given to tens, if not hundreds of millions of people, we have more safety experience with these vaccines than probably any other uh, pharmaceutical <laughs> that has ever existed. <laughs> right. uh, now, 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 you could say we don't have 10 years of safety experience, that's true. Uh, but in terms of the number of overall person years of experience with you know, you, you know, you know, tens of millions of people who received the J and J vaccine, and hundreds of millions of people who receive the Pfizer vaccine, for example, then th there is a huge safety database. Whenever you give something to so many people, you are going to find some very rare side effects. Um, so I think the the overall perspective is that these are more th these vaccines are safer than probably almost any other medical intervention that exists. But any intervention will have some rare side effects, and whenever these side effects are, are, are become known, then they need to be investigated, they need to be understood, they need to be communicated to the public in a very transparent way. And, you know, you know, I think to the most, for the most part, I think there has been a lot of communication about, about that topic. Uh, but equally important is for our public health authorities to do formal benefit risk ratios. Um, and it might, be true that the benefit risk ratio is different in different populations. For example, if we know that a particular side effect is occurs more frequently in a particular gender, a particular age group, a particular demographic, that needs to be taken under consideration uh, in terms of recommending vaccines. Because ultimately, you might end up recommending certain vaccines for certain populations, other vaccines for other populations, or you might have a vaccine in which the risk benefit ratio is overwhelmingly beneficial in all groups and all people which actually is the case of all three of the vaccines in the United States now, that, that the risk benefit ratios uh, from people unrelated to the companies, so no profit motive, unrelated to the academic investigators who might have some vested interest in one or another. Um, so the, the, the independent public health authorities have determined that the benefit risk ratio for all three of the vaccines that are currently in the United States are overwhelmingly in favor of benefit over risk. Now, the one area that is not yet determined is in young children. And that's just because that the data hasn't yet emerged in young, in, in, in young children for vaccines. Now, that obviously is uh, um, an area of substantial discussion as well. Uh, but for that, we actually don't yet have the data. The hope is that there will be data by the end of the calendar year. How do we conduct a case investigation to determine whether the vaccine presents a new unsuspecting risk. Now that we're eight or nine months in, has there been any evidence that has arisen that is a cause of concern? Well, I mean, the, the, the causes of concern are, are really the, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the conditions that I talk, talked about earlier. Um, uh, there, there, these vaccines have been scrutinized by the general public and by doctors and scientists uh, in a larger number of people uh, at a greater extent than almost any, anything else in medicine. Uh, so, so what we know is that there can be some side effects in the level of a couple out of a million cases uh, for, 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 for all of these vaccines. Uh, but it has, to be, it has to be thought of in that light. And many of these side effects, such as myocarditis or thrombosis, actually are seen with COVID infection as well. And so the actual risk of thrombosis of, or, or myocarditis, which are the two most worrisome things with the vector and mRNA vaccines, those are actually seen at a very high level if you actually get COVID infection. So you're at, actually your chances of um, uh, getting those serious conditions are actually higher if you don't get vaccinated and are lower if you get vaccinated. How do we evaluate preventability, predictability, reversibility, 
of the risk of a vaccine reaction occurring, but in the future, either via side effects from continued vaccinations, mainly as an example, continuing booster shots. I'm not sure I completely understand your question, but I mean, booster shots is obviously a sort of the topic du jour. Uh, and it's currently not fully resolved in the scientific community, uh, the, the need for booster shots or the pace or the kinetics of booster shots. Uh, we know that the, the government wants to be conservative and wants to recommend booster shots for everybody at uh, six to eight months after their initial vaccines. I think in the scientific community, it is being debated, uh, the, the, the need for that. I think most people agree that with any vaccine, you probably need a booster shot at some point in time. And um, if you're fighting off a hyper-infectious Delta variant, it kind of makes sense to do that sooner rather than later. Uh, but we do know that the efficacy of the vaccines do wane over time. And if the immune responses wane over time and we were facing a surge with a hyper-infectious virus variant, then it, it does make conceptual sense uh, to have people boosted sooner rather than later. Uh, but again, as you point out, it's a sort of a risk-benefit analysis. It's really the risk and it's not so much the risks of adverse events with the vaccine, which are extraordinarily low, uh, but it's really the risks of uh, more, more and potentially more severe types of breakthrough infections as immunity wanes versus um, uh, the logistic challenges of rolling out another shot into people's arms. Is it realistic to say that we can vaccinate the world even if everyone wants to get the vaccine? That's again, what, like eight, nine billion uh, can we produce enough is the big picture question before another variant arises? That seems like an incredibly difficult task. Well, I think it is an incredibly difficult task, but I think it's the task that we need to address. It's the single most important uh, task to address to, uh, to bring this pandemic under control. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, we as a human species have stepped up to new challenges and have done things that have never been done before uh, many times. And I think this is another time where, uh, where the importance of doing this uh, needs to supersede any anxiety of, of it being difficult or not being able to be done. I actually think that we have a pretty good chance at this because we're not relying on any one uh, supplier. There's not a single vaccine developer that could do this alone, uh, but uh, right. with, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, J and J, as well as two, at least two Chinese companies, all committing to making over a billion doses of vaccines, maybe even two billion doses of vaccine over the next year. Then there should be sufficient vaccine supply to vaccinate everyone in the world. Then comes down to the question of the logistic challenge of how do you actually get vaccine to those people, and I think that's where um, uh, different vaccines being used together is a good thing because each, each vaccine has different properties. Uh, some vaccines can be given as uh, two shots. Some vaccines can be given as a single shot. Uh, some vaccines are more stable at room temperature uh, and some vaccines need to be uh, kept in the ultra deep freeze. So obviously if, if you need to vaccinate a small community in Central Africa in which there is no freezers in that community, right. then you probably need a vaccine that doesn't need to be frozen, just as an example. A last question before I get to the big picture question that was in our title, uh, and I think it's a pinch off topic, but I'm gonna ask it. Uh, one of our participants sent it in. Uh, please ask Dr. Dan to speak of the efficacy. Now I know what all three of these are, but I'm gonna mispronounce all of them. <laughs> Hydrocloxacorin, Ivermectin, and Remdesivir as an alternative, and this is his words, to the three vaccines. Well, first, so, um, so hydroxychloroquine, um, ivermectin, and uh, remdesivir, uh, well, uh, one of them is a therapeutic. The other ones are not really therapeutics. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the use of drugs is really different than the use for vaccines. So vac they, they're, they're for different purposes. So they don't overlap with each other. So vaccines need to be given to healthy people to prevent infection or reduces the severity of infection if you get infected. Drugs are only given to people once they are infected to try to uh, reduce symptoms. 
Now, now, now drugs would not be useful to control a global pandemic because you can't treat everyone in the world with any of these drugs. They're really meant to help individuals who do get infected. Turns out that the, that the drugs don't really work very well. Hydroxychloroquine is generally thought of as not effective. Um, I think that recent, I, I think there's recently uh, uh, recommendations to sort of take it off uh, the list of even potentially effective drugs. Uh, there's sort of a lot of very curious debate about ivermectin, but there's no evidence of efficacy of that. Remdesivir does have some efficacy in some trials, but not others. So of those three, then remdesivir has, I would say, limited effectiveness as a drug, but is not very good. So as of now, we don't have any good drugs for COVID-19. Monoclonal antibodies are probably the best we have, but are limited in, in who they can be used for and how they are used and availability as well. We understand. So, the, so the, the drugs and the vaccines, they both have an important role, but neither one can substitute for the other. For example, if someone is sick coming into your hospital and can't breathe, a vaccine is not going to help that person. They need, they need therapy. They need drugs to help them. Whereas a, a healthy person on a population level, they need vaccines. So drugs and vaccines, they're both needed for the pandemic and their use is, not, is non-overlapping. So we need both. We understand that you have a vision for preventing a future pandemic. What do you have in mind and what do you need to make it happen? Well, I mean, think of what we've been through in the last 18 months. You know, people debate the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine or the risk benefit ratios of vaccines. Um, and there, there's obviously a lot of discussion of, you know, how things should be rolled out, you know, should there be mask mandates? I mean, there's as much controversy as there are people who discuss these issues. And that's, I think, part of the process, because what we faced in the last 18 months is an unprecedented global pandemic. And I think regardless of how anyone feels about any of these issues, I think every single one of us would wish that when there's another pandemic, it could be stopped in its tracks before it becomes a global pandemic. And I would venture to guess that virtually every single person on the planet would wish that could happen. So what, what we're thinking, um, um, moving from COVID-19 to essentially pandemic preparedness in general, is that what we need to have is we need to have uh, class-based drugs and class-based vaccines. What do I mean by that? Most viruses come as part of different families. There is influenza virus, there's members of the influenza virus family, there's members of the coronavirus family. One example of that is COVID-19. Another example of that is the original SARS. Another example of that is the common cold coronaviruses. They're all part of the same family. They're different from each other, but they, they're sort of clustered together. Over here, we have the influenza viruses. Over there, we have another group of viruses called flaviviruses, like Zika virus and other viruses. An another part of the you know, spectrum, we have viruses that can be transmitted by mosquitoes and ticks and things like that. Um, and what we, what, what we think we have the technology to do is to make uh, class-based vaccines that will have at least some level of efficacy for all members in the class. For example, we might be able to make a pan-coronavirus vaccine that uh, not only uh, has efficacy against COVID-19, but also against the next coronavirus that we don't know of yet. Now, those class-based vaccines, or drugs for that matter, they will never be as effective as a vaccine or a drug made for the specific virus in question. They can't be, but they can be made in advance. So what we're thinking is that we should develop an arsenal of uh, either drugs or vaccines or both that have efficacy against multiple viruses in a class. You can make a, um, a coronavirus vaccine that has broad activity for all coronaviruses. You can make an influenza vaccine that has broad activity for all flu viruses, another one for all of flaviviruses, and they could be stockpiled. And then when there's the next pandemic, say cycle back to January of 2020, it was 41 cases of a new coronavirus in Wuhan, China, one person died. How much better would it have been for the world 
if at that point in time, we could swoop into Wuhan and then give everyone in, the, in a small cluster around that area a coronavirus vaccine, it may not have the 90% efficacy that a COVID-19 vaccine made for COVID-19 can have, but what if it had 50, 60% efficacy? It would be probably enough to stop the spread of that virus to the rest of the world and all the consequences of that in terms of millions of deaths, um, countless uh, economies devastated and countless uh, infringement in everyone's lives. So how much better would it have been if we had a class-based vaccine for coronaviruses that could be applied at, at, the, at the initial stage of an outbreak before it's spread throughout the world? And what that could do is it could give us time. I mean, first, that might, with, with so few cases, that might just be enough to stop it. And if it doesn't stop it, it will certainly slow the spread substantially. And during that time, then, you know, instead of being a year, maybe we can develop specific vaccines in six months next time. It might be enough time to then develop a specific vaccine for a particular outbreak. But what's critical is for us now to develop class-based drugs and vaccines uh, against multiple members in a class, even if it means that it's not as effective for any one particular virus. But as long as it has some reasonable substantial amount of efficacy, it could be used as a tool to prevent the next uh, outbreak. I should emphasize the importance of, uh, of, of uh, philanthropy in the start of any of these projects. I mean, whenever something needs to be done immediately, then, then the only resource need, the only resource available to do that is philanthropic funding. That's how we were able to start immediately working on uh, COVID-19 in January 2020. It would take, you know, sort of nine to 12 months uh, to obtain traditional government type of funding. So what's critical in any sort of urgent situation or pandemic response situation is, uh, uh, is, is philanthropy. That's really going to be the cornerstone uh, of, of a rapid response. And as we begin to close and some further questions came in, I'll ask you, it's 1158 Eastern. Do you have a hard stop in two minutes or could we go five minutes longer? Um, I, I could go a couple minutes longer. Okay, let me, we'll go rapid fire on these two questions that came in. If the key to stopping the COVID pandemic is vaccinating the world, what is Johnson & Johnson doing to ensure this? They seem to have the silver bullet single dose solution, which can be distributed through standard channels. Yeah, so I think that, so first, J&J can't do it alone. Really, as I said before, it really needs to be a coordinated effort of all the major vaccine developers. But there are unique features of different vaccines. Some unique features of the J&J &J vaccine is that it is effective with a single dose. Uh, a boost will almost certainly increase those responses, but a single dose still gives substantial efficacy. And it can be uh, stored in liquid form for prolonged periods of time, six months or even possibly longer than that. So we do think that it will have the reach to reach those, those uh, small communities in the developing world that might be more difficult to reach with some of the other vaccines. And so, so J&J &J is committed to producing at least a billion doses of vaccine and, and actually giving it away on a nonprofit basis which is something that hasn't been widely discussed in the media, but giving it, essentially giving it, donating it to COVAX and, um, um, and, and delivering it on a nonprofit basis to make it affordable um, at uh, essentially at uh, pennies or dollars a dose, affordable to everyone in the developing world and to distribute it, the physical properties allow it to be um, uh, delivered to the developing world. I guess last question, then a quick close. Can you mix vaccines? For example, get Moderna now and Johnson & Johnson as a booster. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the initial booster data that is submitted to the FDA and likely will be the first recommendations will probably be getting boosted with the same vaccine you got initially, just because that's the first data set. But there are studies ongoing now we're doing one of them, but many other people are doing them in which people are doing this mix and match approach where you might get one vaccine then being boosted with another. Those data sets are not as advanced, 
So you'll probably hear the initial recommendation for boosters will probably be to get boosted with whatever you got before, but the, stay tuned because very soon thereafter, there will be data coming out showing uh, safety and likely interesting immune responses with a so-called mix and match approach as well. And there are theoretical reasons why a mix and match approach might actually be better because each of these vaccines essentially samples a different immune space. And if you have a mix and match approach, theoretically, you might actually be able to get the best of both worlds. Interesting. And as we now close, uh, you did mention philanthropy being very important and how it kind of did come through pretty well using this as an example relative to the research and the work that you're doing for those that would have an interest in learning more of being a contributor or a philanthropist or possibly other business centric initiatives. How could they learn more? Is there someone from your team they could reach out to? Sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, they should reach out to uh, uh, Liz, uh, uh, and we can provide you with with the names and emails of, uh, of of our contacts. Because the vast majority of people will hear this in a recording, uh, is it possible to give her email now, or is there a website they could go to and find her contact info? Uh, sure. Is um, could we promote uh, either Liz or Ria to be a speaker? Sure. Oh, Just in the last uh, couple minutes. Liz yes. Callahan or Rhea uh, Brubaker. I see her now. Rhea, hold on a second. And you should be able to be what's called a panelist right about now. But I, Rhea, is that you? <laughs> Let's give it a couple of more seconds. Hello. Oh yes, we can hear you. Hi, actually, this is Liz, um, and I am happy to put in chat my contact information. We'd love to hear from you. Um, share that. My um, contact information is Liz, L-I-Z, C-A-L-L-A-N-A-N, -A -A um, at gmail.com, and I will also put it in chat, my BIDMC um, information. So let me do that immediately. We'd happy to answer any questions and carry on the conversation. Of course. It is true that that uh, without philanthropic funding, there would be no way that we could have done uh, what we did for COVID-19, uh, certainly not in the same time frame. Uh, it, it would have been much more prolonged, it would have taken a lot longer, for sure. Yeah, that's kudos to the tremendous people that are philanthropists out there. And where America really shines as a country, Many people that have done well often do give back to their communities locally, nationally, and in this case, in COVID, really globally. So kudos to them and certainly keep it up. Don't stop here. Uh, being active through your foundations and philanthropy, however it may be, is very important from a societal perspective and uh, keep that gas pedal going strong. Uh, not just Americans, but those around the world, it really benefits everyone. Uh, Dr. Baruch, I know you have to run. I'm going to do about a 30 second to one minute close, but you may leave now. I understand. I appreciate your time and look forward to the next time. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully people found it informative, hopefully interesting, and um, uh, really appreciate people's attention. Thank you, Dr. Baruch. We appreciated it greatly. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles, the host of the Angelo Robles podcast, the founder and CEO of Family Office Association. A little different topic today than normally the investing centric or even other initiatives that we do inside the family office and the family of wealth community, but this impacts them and impacts everyone. And again, many of them are very active philanthropists as well. So I think it was important to go down that road too. learn more about family office association at familyofficeassociation.com. Follow me on social media or family office on YouTube. And you could find us, let's look it up either by my name or probably more importantly, the company name, Family Office Association. Thank you all for your time today. And again, thank everyone, Elizabeth, for putting this together. Uh, certainly, Tom, I don't know if people want their last name mentioned, so I'll be a little bit discreet with that. But at the end of the day, Dr. Baruch, we appreciate it greatly. Thank you for your time.